Christy, and thanks. And thanks to the Cotton Board for the Cotton and Coffee program. Um, it's been very successful. I know our staff has really enjoyed uh, being part of it. Um, and this is actually my second go around. So hopefully I have something new to add. And uh, uh, what I'm gonna do this morning is basically give you a shortened version of a presentation I made just a couple of days ago to the board of directors on what I see in the market as far as uh, the key issues, both short-term, long-term, and then what we are doing to try to uh, uh, take advantage in some cases of those things or uh, try to put cotton in the best possible uh, situation that we can to increase demand and profitability for cotton. So I'm gonna share my screen here and see if I can get that. Got it? Uh, can everybody see that okay? Looks great, Barry. Okay. All right, so I'll get right in it. Usually I have more slides than I have time. So I'm gonna pop right in here and uh, tell you what we're gonna cover. And that's gonna be, um, move that, it's not moving here. Oh, there we go. Uh, give you a quick, just a couple of slides on some of the key indicators right now in the marketplace and how that's affecting cotton. Then we'll look sort of a summary of uh, some external factors that are shaping the entire uh, textile apparel landscape and how that may be affecting cotton and the way we operate. Then get into specifics of the Cotton Incorporated 2022 budget and maybe just as part of that, taking a little longer view of how the sort of the market may be changing and what we have to do to uh, take advantage of that. So we'll start with simply a few slides on the market status. And like I said, these are only going to be a, a couple of things, a snapshot of some of the uh, factors really shaping demand and which I think is the key driver right now, honestly, in the, uh, uh, which is a possibly affecting the, uh, the price of cotton is the fact that demand was picked up much faster than anyone had expected. And one of the, if you look in the U.S., one of the uh, sort of indicators is taking a look at overall consumer spending versus income. Uh, the, the line on the bottom, the blue line represents consumer spending adjusted for inflation that's kind of a key measure of the overall economy. As you know, consumer spending represents, I think, close to 70% of the overall um, GDP in the US. And at the top line, the red line, which is more volatile, is uh, a concept called real disposable income. That's income adjusted for inflation and also it takes out taxes. So this is what consumers have left to spend. And the reason that line is so jagged in the recent period is because of all the stimulus money that's come in. So. You saw what happened with COVID. We saw March, April, May drop to unprecedented levels in terms of consumer spending. A lot of stimulus money came in and the gap between uh, income and consumer spending represents consumer saving. And when you have such a large uh, amount of consumer savings for a while, eventually that gap gets closed with higher consumer spending. And that's kind of what's happened. We're seeing kind of a really a V-shaped recovery Consumer spending is almost on the, uh, the trend line that was pre-COVID, not quite, but it's actually, in most cases, it's a better recovery than, than uh, was anticipated. The current savings rate in the US, I think right now, I just looked this morning, is about 9.4%. And that's still uh, well above the historical average of around 6.5%. So what that means is, as consumers become more confident, hopefully we can get through this second, this uh, current wave of COVID, but as they get more confident, they'll tend to spend more and they've got actually ability to do that right now uh, with that large level of savings. So that's good for the apparel market. And we're seeing that in the US uh, after a big drop in um, March, April, May, just like overall consumer spending, the same thing happened in cotton. This is kind of our best indicator of uh, demand for cotton in the US market. You know, after we lost a lot of market share because of the price spike in 2010, we've been kind of on a jagged recovery. Uh, and now we're back on again on that trend line. Currently we're consuming about internally, this is at the retail level, somewhere on an annualized rate of about 20 million bales. Uh, again, which is about the best numbers we've had almost since 2010. Hopefully that can continue as the economy overall continues to grow. Of course, there's two components of, uh, of the demand for cotton. There's the overall market growth and how that affects the retail market for all of textiles and apparel. 
But then we also look at market share uh, because we, if we gain market share, we can grow faster. And that's kind of what's happened in recent months. You know, we, as I said before, we lost a lot of market share to synthetic fibers after 2010. And then what happened was there was a sort of a, a fashion change that uh, favored athletic apparel, you know, the, what they were referring to as athleisure. And that was a real negative for cotton. So uh, we went from about 60, over 60% to about 50%. Then when COVID really hit it, at its peak, the most of the apparel that was being sold was sort of what we call it protective apparel, uh, had a disproportionately higher level of sales. That tends to be less cotton. So we had even a worse situation for cotton relative to other fibers, but now that has rebounded. And now we're uh, actually uh, most recent numbers on imports. That's what I'm using, basing this on, is that cotton's market share has recovered uh, above pre-COVID levels. Uh, there is some research in our uh, con uh, corporate strategy and insights uh, department at Cotton Incorporated that suggests that consumers are very uh, positively disposed to cotton at the moment. In fact, I, you know, there's a lot of research that goes into it, but I'm just going to give you one snapshot slide that kind of summarizes all of it. 84% uh, of consumers say cotton is the most comfortable fiber. They also believe that cotton is the most sustainable fiber. As you know, sustainability is becoming a, a bigger component of, of uh, you know, consumers' mindsets. I mean, they don't necessarily always buy product based on sustainability, but it's certainly something that they hold the brands and retailers accountable. So the brands and retailers are sourcing product based on what they think the consumer thinks is important. And also very important is that 71% of consumers say that cotton is, uh, compared to man-made fiber, the highest quality. Uh, for some of you who kind of keep track of the whole fashion sort of industry, uh, it was really uh, a big, for a number of years, fast, what was called fast fashion, which is kind of low quality garments, uh, tended to be man-made fibers or polyester, uh, mostly women's wear. People would wear it for a while and then toss it out. Well, that's obviously not very sustainable. That's not a good environmental story. And now there's a lot of pushback against this whole concept of fast fashion. Cotton products tend to last longer. We know from our own internal research that products in the consumer's uh, closets that are the oldest tend to be cotton products. You know, think of your own cotton sweatshirts or pair of jeans that might outlast any kind of synthetic fiber product out there. So as consumers are rethinking sort of the, you know, how they buy, you know, this is, uh, we're positioned positively, especially with the things with, on the plastics and other negatives associated, associated with man-made fibers. So this positive trend that we're seeing that may have some legs, which could be very positive for cotton. On the negative side, you know, I know there's no such thing as a price that's, uh, you know, that's too high. Obviously, we want high prices for producers. Um, but at the same time, polyester prices are about, I think at the, on the moment, they're about 50 cents a pound. So one of the ways we look at uh, our competitiveness for cotton is to take the price ratio of cotton and we use the world price for cotton or the A index and we divide it by the price of polyester. Now, if you go back all the way to 1990, uh, this ratio has averaged about 1.4, meaning cotton is 40% higher. So the world price of cotton is about 40% higher than the internal price of polyester in China. China is the largest supplier of polyester. I think they supply over 70% of the world's polyester. So with prices uh, increasing uh, in recent, uh, you know, in a recent uh, period, and polyester prices have come up as well, but the ratio of cotton to polyester is still very, very high compared to historical averages. Now, the good news of that is despite this sort of price disadvantage on the, at the market level, uh, the demand for cotton has picked up pretty strongly, and uh, both in the United States and outside. So that might be a signal that, that cotton can withstand this uh, sort of a higher than normal price ratio against synthetics. I don't have a slide showing you here of uh, the other competitor, which is rayon or viscose. And cotton prices, I would think, are probably 25% above the norms for, uh, say, the historical ratio of cotton to viscose prices or cotton to rayon prices. So on our two main competitors, we have a, a pretty substantial price disadvantage, but nevertheless, demand has picked up uh, very nicely here in the past year or so. 
USDA came out with a report uh, just last week. Uh, they are estimating that world cotton demand is going to jump to, uh, I think it's about 122 to 23 million bales. This graph is maybe one month old, um, which is the highest level we've had in a while. Uh, we've had a lot of setbacks, uh, you know, externally. You know, we had, the, of course, the price spike, which I mentioned before. Uh, in around early 2000s, we had sort of a, another uh, economic uh, recession, which really hit cotton pretty hard. Um, so a combination of the financial crisis and the price spike for cotton. And now we had tariffs in 2019 and COVID in 2020. Nevertheless, cotton has rebounded. And the important thing here is, uh, even though I don't, I'm not showing a graph uh, of the production side, is that if we do reach that 122 or 23 million bale demand, world production, I think is estimated right now about 118 and a half or so. So that's a four and a half million bale gap, meaning more people are using cotton than they were producing it. And that means inventories are coming down. And when inventories come down, typically that's a, that's a uh, you know, foundation for higher sort of than average prices. And that's kind of what we're seeing in the marketplace. A lot of things are going up because of inflation, but nevertheless, cotton has done pretty well, certainly better than we would have thought a year ago. So let's take a look now at just some of the big picture strategic issues and then we'll get into uh, specifics of uh, sort of what Cotton Incorporated is, is uh, trying to do to, uh, to put cotton in the best possible light, and particularly U.S. cotton. So these are some of the long-term issues affecting the marketplace, uh, and we're going to go into some of these in just a minute. Uh, these are things even external of cotton, but certainly having an influence in some cases on the, on the market for cotton. Number one is forced labor and other social concerns. And what that means, you know, specifically right now, that is in Western China, where there's the, the accusation that uh, uh, the Uyghur population is, uh, is uh, you know, faced uh, uh, basically forced labor uh, situation in, uh, in those, that region. And what that is, is doing, aside from the fact that the government is not letting product come in, in from uh, companies and products that contain any kind of forced labor is force the supply chain, not only in this industry, but all industries to know exactly where the product is made, how it's made, uh, all things associated with that. In the, in the past, it's not been that way. So that is a clear indicator that we as an organization or as an industry have got to be on board with this whole concept of how do we trace the product all the way through the supply chain so that it, uh, it puts cotton in the best possible uh, you know, position. And specifically, it's a huge potential advantage for US cotton. Now, one of the outcomes of that is, in my opinion, is going to be underneath that is supply chain diversification. Right now, I think about 30% of all the goods that are produced, cotton goods, into the US retail market come from China. At one time, it was closer, I think, to almost, um, we'll show a graph in a minute, closer to 40%. It's been as high as almost 50%, I think, in Europe, or 45%. It was almost 80%, I think, in Japan. And now what's happened is you put all those eggs in one basket and something happens, it's not a good situation for the brands and retailers. So they're going to be looking at spreading out the risk, and that's going to have implications for how we operate, but also have implications in terms of the uh, our exports of product, uh, raw cotton exports over the coming years. Sustainability, circularity, we'll cover that. That's obviously that's been important for, for the last five to 10 years. That's growing importance. Uh, with COVID and lack of travel, more and more companies are evaluating product digitally, um, you know, meaning that uh, we don't, you don't get to go visit and have them touch and feel the new fabrics. You have to have a digital version of that. Some cases we have it 3D, so we're very well positioned to show off new innovations in cotton on a digital world. Consumers are changing their viewing habits, and um, the media buy is going to be a, a changing as a result of that. You know, used to you turn on television, you watch three or four channels, and that was it. Then cable comes along, spreads out the number of channels, and now with the streaming, video, and all different ways consumers get their information it's really changing the landscape of how you try to reach consumers. Next is Brazil. Brazil is going to be the biggest competitor for U.S. cotton, hands down. They're growing in terms of their productive capacity, not only in cotton, but corn, soybeans, and wheat as well. Uh, they'll be a major player. 
uh, kind of mentioned consumer buying behavior, that's changing. Younger consumers today, not buying the same quantity that they may be looking at having product last longer. So that could still be a, an opportunity for cotton. We're gonna to have to live in the world of polyester being cheaper than cotton, but I think we can survive that. Uh, post pandemic normal business practices. You know, We like to go visit our accounts one-on-one, -on -one, but the accounts may not be in a position to take visitors for some time. Um, and that's gonna, again, change the way we operate. We're, everybody's doing a lot of Zoom meetings and it won't, you know, it'll be a hybrid between what we're doing now and po probably the way it used to be. And last but not least, uh, if you look at graphs on the public sector investment in agriculture, that's been going down relative to uh, the public, the private sector investment in agriculture. This is something we're concerned about, and that's one of the reasons, as you'll see, that Cotton Incorporated has been increasing its percentage of investment uh, in the ag research uh, area within, within the company. So how do we improve cotton's position versus other fibers? Number one, as I said, we've got to make sure that we're in a position to trace cotton and uh, uh, be very transparent about it. We'll be working. That's one of our key initiatives this coming year and this year as well. Circularity is another uh, component of sustainability, meaning that you know everybody wants not only just to use the product, but they want to recycle and repurpose the materials. We're looking at how to do that in cotton. Uh, you don't have to worry, we're not gonna replace raw fiber for sure, but there may be ways of adding a little bit back, but also potentially converting some of the cotton to glucose and to repurpose it in a different uh, medium. We're already doing a little of that in the blue jeans go green where we're turning it into insulation, but that's a big deal, particularly in the European markets. Uh, and that's in, in some of the uh, sort of the I'll call it the markets in the Western part of the US. Innovative competitive products, of course, we gotta to continue to make better products because you can't just promote without substance in a sense of having a product to back it up. So we continue to look for ways of, of having cotton compete in wrinkle resistance or uh, stain resistance or you know, other uh, moisture transfer, all kinds of different uh, you know, ways that consumers want product today than they used to. We want to exploit competitive fiber weaknesses. Right now, there are two major weaknesses in polyester. Number one, it produces microplastics, and that's a big problem uh, worldwide. People are re recognizing that. And two, and kind of related to it, as I mentioned before, fast fashion is a big becoming a negative in the marketplace. So the demand for better quality will tend to help cotton. Uh, as I said, cotton product, uh, products last longer. Broad markets for cotton is something we've been working on, but it's a tough one. About 80% of the demand for cotton goes into apparel, maybe 70, I'll say 75 to 78% in apparel, maybe 20, 22% in home furnishings and just a little bit elsewhere. So we're very heavily dependent on one market for our product. And last but not least, of course, sustainability, which you, we've already talked about. And in particular here, as I transition to US cotton, is gonna be uh, the US tr Cotton Trust Protocol. So how do we enhance our competitiveness against other cottons around the world? Well, we wanna lower production costs for sure, uh, try to increase yields. We've got to do something about plastic contamination. Uh, we've got research that's been ongoing for several years now there. Um, that is a, a, a problem because we do not want to lose the premium for US cotton right now there's a huge demand for US cotton because of some of these other issues, particularly the forced labor issue. But as this settles down eventually, uh, if we don't have this contamination issue fixed, um, you know, we, we could be in a position where uh, we really do lose that, that the, the sort of the premium and the, uh, the brand of US cotton, which has basically been contamination free. Uh, we have a great opportunity in sustainability, what growers are doing in the US, surpasses any growers in the world with uh, you know, maybe the US and Australia being the top two. Um, the US Cotton Trust Protocol, which is a, a program of the National Cotton Council, but really it's an industry-wide effort to, uh, to try to supply cottons for some brands and retailers who need that extra level of verification. So we think that's a really important program and a great opportunity to position US cotton as the most sustainable of all sustainable cottons. So we have been working with the National Cotton Council. Jesse Daystar, who's head of our sustainability group, um, has uh, 
has worked is, is an advisor to the board. I know Marjorie Walker on the on the program has been very active in that as well. So we think that's a, that's a really a, a very important program and we urge growers to really get involved and sign up. We want to increase cottonseed value, both in terms of research and marketing, improve fiber quality in the long term. Our EFS program is something that connects U.S. cotton, uh, excuse me, yes, connects U.S. cotton with the mills because once they start using this, uh, this management tool, they tend to have a higher percentage of U.S. cotton. So it's, uh, we market that here in the U.S., but also externally. CCI is the export promotion arm of the U.S. cotton industry. We support CCI with a, a contribution of two and a half billion dollars. Hopefully that'll increase next year. We got to cultivate export markets for U.S. cotton because if we want to grow 20 million bales of cotton, uh, we're going to have to export probably 17 of those. And that's a lot big, a big task. And whenever this possible, it hasn't happened yet. Any kind of opportunity in this hemisphere, including the U.S., we want to enhance those opportunities. So that's a, that's a mouthful in terms of sort of the issues, but uh, that's kind of the big picture landscape. So as we roll into the budget proposal uh, for this upcoming year, sort of what are we looking at? Um, the, the good news is we have a, a slight increase in our budget for 2022 after a pretty big drop in 21. Uh, we're up 2%, so our budget will be $82 million versus I think it's 80.36 in, in 21. Uh, of course, the drop, as you know, is the sort of the lag effect of having uh, low crops, uh, COVID with imports down and then the price of cotton was down a year or so ago. All those things take about a year or so to roll into our budget. So the, the positive things that are happening now uh, will begin to affect our budget as we go forward. So we think we've got a couple of years at least, hopefully more of having uh, increased budgets and, and be able to tackle some of these issues. In terms of the budget priorities for this upcoming year, and these are not necessarily in, I didn't put these in, in order. So ones, they're all important. So certainly producer profitability and specifically crop protection. We have uh, all of the increase in the ag budget is going to crop protection, but also try to increase seed value through research and promotion, but anything in, to, to lower costs and raise yields and improve the value, uh, certainly a key uh, priority for this coming year and every year really. Uh, as I said before, plastic contamination, um, we've done some research, um, looked at several systems. Uh, we're looking at another phase of research next year. So there's gonna be additional money going into the fiber quality, uh, excuse me, the fiber competition area for another wave of plastic contamination research. Supply chain traceability, transparency, that's, that's I mentioned before why that's important. That really affects multiple divisions of the company. We're doing everything from looking at technologies to trace cotton to technologies that help brands, retailers monitor their supply chain. Um, we're looking at being sort of a conduit between technology and the industry, uh, uh, talking about some of these things, uh, holding seminars with the information that we have. The National Cotton Council is doing a great job of making sure that they are connected on the lobbying side on this issue. So we, we just had a meeting last week with NCC and CCI on, on the issue to try to make sure we're all connected. We do, of course, we do not do any lobbying whatsoever, but we can provide uh, factual information if needed uh, to Gary and uh, the National Cotton Council. Sustainability circularity is something that's been going on for some time. We've got continued research there. And we also don't want to forget, we, we want to maintain strong consumer and industry promotion because we have this opportunity right now to sort of prime the pump, the, the things are moving up for cotton. We don't want to lose that, so we want to make sure we have still have resources to uh, to promote cotton uh, in any way we can. So we have four basic committees. Uh, for those who are on the board, know this, and they kind of in our company, and they kind of fall in the area of going say from the agricultural side at one end, and then we move to sort of the textile research part, and then it kind of moves in the supply chain to marketing the you know, products in the supply chain. And last but not least is the consumer marketing area. So I'll talk about sort of the, some of the priorities and there's, there's probably more in all of these uh, uh, in, in each of the four areas and tell you what their, their budget increase will be this year. The biggest increase of all the four committees is agricultural research, which includes uh, the core program, state support, as well as uh, sustainability division. On the margin in our core program, uh, all the increase in funds will go into the crop protection 
with a heavy emphasis on weed management, continue to monitor FOV4 and other, other issues. Of course, looking at, continue looking at lower cost production strategies. We're supporting the winter nursery. A variety improvement is a, is a key metric in our group. Planting seed quality has been an issue for several years, looking at that as well. We have some very, very promising research being done on cottonseed oil that will be coming out, I hope, in the next uh, several months, but it looks very promising from a, a believe it or not, from a health uh, situation. And we know that we, we also, we, we need higher oil prices as well as whole seed prices to keep the crush industry going. Uh, ginning and harvesting research and certainly plastic contamination prevention. We're looking at plastic contamination in three parts. Uh, Ed Barnes is spearheading sort of keeping it the best we can, best practices to keep it from getting into the gin. Uh, Vicki Martin is heading up our research in terms of removing it at the gin. And Mike Shin in our text product development implementation is working to try to figure out other ways to effectively move it, remove it from uh, the spinning mill. And obviously we don't want it to come to that because by then it's already been a discounted product. <clears throat> we are really, uh, I think this has been a great thing, a cooperation between our staff and the cotton board in terms of trying to leverage resources for NEFA grants. Uh, that's what is at the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, we've been successful with some of those that it allows our funds to be highly leveraged. So we, I think we have something like nine applications. We won't, uh, we, we, I think we can do a maximum of five if we get them, there's no guarantee, but it's something that, that helps leverage your dollars uh, for very important agricultural research. On the sustainability side, we support the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol and we really want to um, delve more into the micro and the macro plastic situation because that is a big disadvantage for the synthetic fibers and an advantage for cotton. Cotton fibers make their way into water streams just like synthetics, but cotton biodegrades. And even in some areas, let's say if you don't have a high enough oxygen content like at the bottom of the ocean in some places and it doesn't degrade, there's no, there's no evidence that cotton is a, uh, a problem in, in, uh, for fish eating it, to so cellulose, whereas synthetics we know that fish are eating that stuff and uh, we're finding it. And, and there's some actual health research going on right now to look at uh, marine health as a result of plastic contamination. And of course, we wanna be an advocate in cotton sustainability. Uh, in our program, if you go back, say another 20 some odd years or so um, and adjust the ag budget by inflation, we've actually, this is the only area in the company where we've actually increased in terms of a trend line in our investment. We've had, we expanded state support. We've expanded the core budget back, um, you know, it doesn't go up and down all the time, but this has actually been on a positive trend uh, in terms of the budget on uh, ag research expenditures. And our R&D side, it's kind of a two, two area. One of the ways we, we felt like we could really attack uh, some of these issues is to delay capital equipment expenditures for a year. So in the R&D side, and they do need upgraded, you know, like spinning equipment, dyeing and finishing equipment, that kind of thing. But we felt like that we could postpone that for at least a year. So even though they have an overall budget decline of 11.8%, if you take out the capital part, uh, that's actually an, an increase of 4.6%. So they're going to be working on contamination research, traceability, transparency, trying to improve fiber, um, sustainability and textile processing, it's also very important for new finishes and fabrics to help cotton improve competitiveness um, and look for new uses of cotton. And of course, getting those technologies implemented with the global supply chain team. And again, the capital equipment will be delayed until 2023. In our global supply chain marketing group, um, that's the beginnings of the marketing. Think of that as more technical marketing to the industry um, as opposed to consumers. They're on the front line also of traceability, transparencies, the whole thing with circularity and sustainability. Uh, they have the best access to some of the brands and retailers in terms of the decision makers, particularly in the areas of sustainability. So carrying that message uh, along with our sustainability team and consumer marketing team, providing any information we can on uh, sustainability, positive for cotton or negative for synthetics, is in the hands of supply chain marketing team. 
Uh, they're also charged with uh, helping the R&D team with technology adoptions to expand their market for cotton and uh, digital supply chain opportunities are certainly an, um, important for the supply chain marketing team. So they're working you know, in multiple countries, probably like 30 countries around the, around the world to try to increase the demand for cotton wherever and certainly look for opportunities for US cotton when that's uh, possible. And then last but not least, uh, consumer marketing, we wanna uh, maximize our new advertising campaign effectiveness um, we had to take a big cut in the uh, media spin this current year. We're going to add back to some of that this coming year. Uh, you'll see that in just a minute. Sustainability has always been a key area of emphasis within consumer marketing. Uh, sustainability along with health and wellness and denim are, are three areas that we sort of under the overall umbrella of the fabric of our lives that we try to, to market cotton. We've had programs for the last several years in youth marketing and several years ago, we shifted the promotion responsibility from agriculture research division to the uh, co consumer marketing area, particularly in the in specifically in the um, corporate communication side. That's been very successful. Uh, we have upped our promotion on cottonseed to the highest level, I think, in the history of the company. So uh, I think we're getting some bang for our buck there. Uh, and then we do a lot of consumer industry research to support all the programs of Cotton Incorporated, and get that information disseminated throughout the uh, throughout the world. Really, it's a corporate strategy and insights area, of Cotton Incorporated. And then, last but not least, we're leveraging through brand partnerships. So one of the themes of our program is we want to be highly leveraged in terms of our our dollars, marketing dollars, whenever possible. So if we can work with a partner to kind of prom extra promotion for cotton, we do that. So in all the areas, you know, we were up a little bit this coming year with ag research the most, as I said before, the textile research and development area. I've kind of changed the name for this purposes of this presentation, just kind of tell you what it is. It's down, but it's up, excluding capital. So it's a good story for all the areas of the company. Uh, I mentioned before that in 2021, the advertising media budget, which includes video, digital and trade, took a big hit. Uh, but we're adding back some of that. We're not back to where we were in 2020, but at least uh, we're above the, the current level. So we're, we want to make sure, as I said before, when conditions are ripe to, uh, to try to add back to the marketing area whenever we can. Unfortunately, you know, if you look back 25 years and you adjust the budgets for inflation, the combination of consumer marketing, global supply chain marketing, our budgets in real terms have declined. So uh, you know, we want to make sure when we can we should continue to have enough resources to, um, to have a positive message for cotton whenever possible. Now, this, as I said, these are adjusted for inflation. So it kind of represents a buying power of the consumer marketing, global supply chain marketing team. Now, this doesn't mean that we're less effective. What it means is we have to search for more efficient ways to reach consumers as opposed to the old ways of simply just running an ad on television. There may be other ways to do it working in, in the digital space and uh, uh, brand partnerships and other ways. So it's a sort of a multiple ways of trying to reach brands, retailers and consumers. Um, China's a big issue. Um, as I said before, the sh share of market for China coming into the US, the EU and Japan has declined because of the forced labor situation and also because their costs have been rising as their economy has improved. Uh, and if you look at the amount of cotton they ship to the three areas, US, the EU, and Japan, that's the blue line on the right, is it was as high as about 15 million bale equivalents, but now that's dropped. And uh, that does have an effect on China's mill use. And we know that the, in these three areas that the, the, the theme is, is that they're trying to diversify out of China. So I think in the longer term, while China has a very important consumer market, that's not going to be the engine of growth for uh, cotton demand worldwide as it was uh, during the heyday between the, in, the two, um, in the 90s and to about the mid 2000s. So who benefits when China goes down? Uh, it depends on the area, but Vietnam, Cambodia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, the US, Pakistan, Turkey, and Bangladesh are taking up the market share in the EU, Bangladesh, and Vietnam in Japan. U.S. is the largest of these three. It's just slightly behind is the EU and Japan is much smaller market. But the combination of these three at about one third of the total demand for cotton 
in the U.S. So these are very important markets. Now, I'll skip to the conclusion, which is I think we have the opportunity to consume over 130 million bales of cotton by uh, a decade from now. That's going to increase the trade of cotton probably to around 50 million bale equivalents. That's the yellow line. And, uh, you know, that's going to have some ramifications in terms of who's going to use it and who's going to make the product, who's going to produce it, who's going to use it. Uh, in terms of the mill use, I think it's going to be four areas on the margin that's going to be highly concentrated, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Vietnam. India is an exporting country, uh, so we won't really benefit from India's gain in mill use, but Pakistan, Vietnam, and, and uh, Bangladesh are all importing countries that'll continue, and that offers potential for U.S. cotton. So I think, you know, the ones we'll be keeping them, uh, our uh, eye on are, again, Vietnam probably increased by over 2 million bales, Pakistan imports probably over 2 million bales, um, Bangladesh the same. So on the trade side, those three are going to be major markets for importing cotton. China is still going to be important because they're not, probably not going to produce enough to uh, satisfy their mills. So they'll still be importing the important customers. But this will kind of change the landscape a little bit and it'll change like who's sourcing product, where, you, where brands and retailers are sourcing. So if we're supplying, if we're working with the supply chain, it will definitely have an effect to some extent on, the, uh, on our travel and who we're meeting with. Uh, but again, China's not going away, uh, Turkey's not going away, so, but uh, we've got to export a lot of cotton, so we're going to have to take advantage of these three markets. So that's, uh, in summary, consumer demand has the opportunity to grow. It doesn't have to occur just because of the expansion of the market. I think we have the opportunity to add four or five million bales just from gaining market share back. And in terms of our competition, this is very important to keep in mind, there's only five areas of the, of the world that have, uh, supply cotton on the export market, really. It's about 90% of it, I think. US, Brazil, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and Australia. And Brazil is going to be our largest competitor. They're going to exceed 10 million bales in exports. India is going to be probably pretty stable. Australia's had a terrible drought in the last five years, so it's going to seem like they're exporting more. And Sub-Saharan Africa has the ability to expand acres, and not just for cotton, but other crops as well. So they may be coming a little bit more important as an export competitor. So that's what we're thinking about. There's a lot there. I had to go through it pretty quickly, um, but those are sort of, sort of some of the issues that we're looking at. And uh, at this time, I'll turn it back over to Christy and any questions that you may have. Thanks, Barry, that was great. Um, I think Grant has been keeping an eye on the question box. Are you with us, Grant? Yes. Do you have any questions? So, then? Yep. So we have one for you, uh, comes from Monty. If December cotton goes to a dollar or, or over, will it hurt demand for cotton? That's, that's a good question, Monty. Um, that's kind of gets in the danger area because it's not the it's not the level always. It's it's like the fear of where it's going from there. In other words, when cotton did go to a dollar back in 2010, uh, I was I think I was traveling at the time um, and meeting with the Asian customers, and they were telling me that things were moving so fast that they just didn't know if it was going to two dollars or three dollars. And it was very difficult for them to uh, price their product at the same time fix cotton so that they wouldn't lose money. I mean, it was, it was really, really tough. So it's the volatility. So in the ideal world, if, if things would kind of just settle down, say prices were close to a dollar and they just kind of stabilized, I don't think that's going to hurt. I think if things get really volatile, um, that would be what would hurt cotton. Uh, 